start in a project. I'm going to just make a new project for this. Also, detection, brand new project. And then I'm going to drag in lung KI 67 one. This is a, a very small crop of a lung. Um, everything we're showing you absolutely works on the whole slide images. That's the entire point of QPath. We gave you these crops so that you didn't have to download 50 gigs onto your laptops um, and so that it processes in just a couple minutes, but it everything works. Um, this is a slightly poorly fixed lung in that there should be more, more spaces here and everything kind of collapsed. And if you'd like to learn how to fix lung properly, please talk to Ken. He has instructions. And what we stained for is KI67, which is a marker of cell proliferation. So we are going to start by, um, as we've done a couple of times, setting the stain deconvolution vectors. And what this means is teaching QPath exactly what is blue and exactly what is brown um, and also what is white. Uh, so first, go into the image tab and just double check that it's definitely set as HDAV. It probably is, but it's always nice to check. Then uh, zoom in and draw a small rectangle with a couple of DAB positive cells, a couple of negative cells where you can see the nuclei, and a whole lot of background. Analyze, estimate stain vectors. Um, this po will pop up saying the modal values do not match the current values. Do you want to use uh, if you do you want to use the modal values? Yes, we do. As long as there's a decent amount of background in your rectangle, yes, we do. Um, okay, so then it gives you this nice uh, three scatter plots, um, and this is for every pixel in your rectangle. This is the red, green, and blue values. Um, the brown and the blue arrows here are the default QPath values, and you can see they're they're okay. They do a decent job, um, but um, they're not quite, they don't quite match the actual scatter. Uh, so you can hit auto, and it matches. Um, I I generally just do that. The only thing I do like to change is I like to use a max total optical density of two. Um, just because in my experience that, that hits it just a little bit more accurately um, and hit auto there, tiny, tiny adjustment. Um, and hit okay. All right, um, so color deconvolution, the main thing I want to talk about is what this actually is showing you. So we're looking at three sides of an actual three-dimensional cube. You have color vectors or colors in red, blue, and green. And so if you actually manually grab these, and you can, you could say, click on, oh no, I need to put the mouse back in. You can click on the little ball at the end of these vectors and drag that around manually. And you'll see it move in the other windows. And that's because what you're actually trying to um, project or determine is kind of the outside border of these lines of stain. And so this is just taking a very small section of an image, just like you did where you drew a rectangle and pulled the pixels out, put them in image J, and then ran the 3D color inspector. And um, as you can see, this isn't really covering a huge amount of color space. And that's because brown is kind of middle of the road, every color. And so separating blue out of that can actually be rather difficult. It's best if you can use um, bright field stains that are well separated, like say fast green and fast red, or something as close to red, green, and blue as possible. This is just doing a best estimate to give you um, what is the equivalent of a fluorescent signal where you have just one value for a given stain. And I just had a slide here showing if you misassign this, like if those color vectors are too close together, uh, you can kind of steal the signal from the other channel. So here we have good vectors well spread. If you look along the bottom there, they're along kind of the outside of those spread of pixels. And on the other side, we have one of the vectors is kind of moved towards the center of the spread of pixels. And then when you look in the hematoxylin for the same exact area with the misassigned stain vectors, you're like losing all that hematoxylin signal, even though that nucleus is a combination of DAB and hematoxylin. So you really want to get these vectors right 
if you want to get accurate measurements for each stain. Yes. So are you basically taking like the RGB image and like converting it into like a two channel image? Is that really what we're doing? Three. Kind of like uh, the third channel is the residual. Um, but it's ideally going to be pretty close to zero in most okay. cases, but it's kind of balancing things out because you're not going to have originally have completely orthogonal vectors in RGB, and these last two are not orthogonal. So it's kind of taking a third one to kind of fill in the color space. Okay. Um, the worse your staining is, or if you actually have three stains, you will start to see more show up in the residual vector. Um, and if you get something like a hair on your side, which happens pretty often, that it'll light up in the residuals because it's none of the above. Yeah. Or uh, what is it, the uh, surgical ink? Yes. Okay, um, so when you can check the accuracy with the one, two, three buttons, and you just want to make sure your dab stained cells still have nuclei because they're there and they should have picked up the tax one. Okay, um, so then we're going to draw a rectangle, relatively small, I don't know, 50 ish cells, something like that. Um, that's way more than 50. And go to analyze, cell detection, cell detection. And okay. There's all of these parameters. Um, and as Mike showed at the beginning, the default parameters are pretty reasonable most of the time. So if you don't want to play with these, you don't have to, and you can get some results, but it, it's better to like optimize them for your actual um, stain, uh, your actual experiment. Uh, the ones that I find most important to um, uh, change is first you want to use the correct pixel size. You can check that by going to the image tab. Um, and looking here, and here these pixels were 0.11. I'm going to type in 0.11. Um, and other, other than that, I'm going to just hit run. It's a, it's a okay. computation intensive task. So depending on your computers, it can take anywhere from like a second to a couple of minutes. Yeah. Your areas. Yeah. Especially in high resolution. If you're immediately sad about how long this is taking, make your rectangle smaller. <laughs> um. So okay. With changing nothing else, the pixel size you can also set it to zero, and by default, it'll adapt for the native image resolution. I didn't know that. <laughs> so looking through this, um, so you've got these two outlines for every cell. Um, one is the actual nucleus, which is here. Um, and then one is uh, approximately the cell boundary. And it first detects the nucleus, and then it expands up to, in this case, five microns outwards, or until it hits uh, its neighbor. So your cells will not overlap, um, and they'll be round-ish approximately. Um, sometimes something like this, you get that like nice round circle that's an exact five micron radius and then your metrics. Um, and as we look through here, you do see things like this, where um, it uh, clumped four nuclei into one. Um, if you see a lot of that, where, where the, the nuclei are clumped, what you want to do is reduce this sigma. Um, this is a Gaussian blur that is applied to the image before finding before um, detecting the nuclei. Um, and uh, especially on H and &E images or like hematoxylin, uh, 1.5 is a lot. Um, 0 0.5 is usually sufficient. Uh, so, first thing to notice is now all of my cells have weird shapes um, because with less smoothing, you get more detail. Um, but at least here, it's not quite merging as, as much as it was before. Um, you do see uh, some of these nuclei have been skipped, um, and that's because they are too small to detect. So to change that, I'm going to drop my minimum area and now it's picking these up. Um, okay. 
To turn the outlines on and off, you can either press this, this button up here, or D. And okay, so this is one cell that it is dividing into three, um, which is called over segmentation, which means my, my sigma is too small. Let's bring that back up to one. Um, I'm also gonna just use two pixels because um, I wanna get this. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and the let's see. Overall, this is looking pretty good. Uh, there are some things that are a little weird, but especially something like this. I'm staring at it, and I don't know how many cells that is. Um, and if you don't know, you're not gonna. You probably can't know. Um, I did find when I was practicing this, a couple of things like this, where I don't really think that's a nucleus. I think that's just like a little smudge that happens to look kind of blue. Um, and to get rid of stuff like that, you can raise the threshold. So, yeah, yeah. in the context of yes. bigger yes. yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes, so we can see that um, a nuclei must have a mean intensity greater than whatever this value is. Um, and this is a mean intensity in the hematoxin channel. So when in, in this field, must have a mean intensity greater than 0.2 to be detected. All right, um, I'm gonna give you all a couple of minutes to play with this because honestly, nothing will explain to you what these Feature, what, what these parameters do other than just changing them and running it and seeing what happens. Um, like you can you can just copy mine and, and get reasonable results, but that's not gonna feature as much as going, huh, I wonder what happens if you put in a median filter of five. This will be bad. <laughs> well, it'll be bad results. Um, one of the fun things about software is you can't, I don't wanna say you can't break it because that's just asking for someone to do something really dumb. But like, okay, I deleted all my cells. Whoops, I'm gonna put them back in. It's okay. Nothing bad's gonna happen. Um. Uh, another fun one to play with is this cell expansion. Um. So you can see here. You can see from the like background. This is where the tissue actually ends. But the QPath thinks this is where the cell ends. So I'm going to change the cell expansion to three. And it gets a little closer. Uh, Wednesday, we will go be going through some more advanced um, algorithms for detecting cells um, if this is insufficient accuracy for you. Okay. Yes. When you're comparing um, across like two different images that maybe one's like a control and a treatment, yes. do you, if they're from the same type, do you apply these same exact cell detection parameters? That you have? Yes, the exact same cell detection parameters. And that's a really good point. If you've got multiple images, um, especially if they're like biologically different, like one's super inflamed and one's not, you want to test your settings on both images, um, like in small crops. Of, of representative images and just make sure you're happy before committing um, because yeah, you need to keep them consistent. Okay, how's everyone doing? Everyone got some cells, they, things are good? Okay, once you're done, uh, delete this annotation. Uh, do not keep this as objects, we're deleting everything. Um, and then we're going to make a full image annotation. You can do that either through objects, annotations, create full image annotation. Um, or if you like keyboard shortcuts, uh, control uh, on a Mac command shift. Okay. 
Um, so I want to now make uh, cells on my entire uh, my entire image here. But oh no, I closed the window. I didn't write down my settings. I've deleted everything. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to the workflow tabs, tab, and this is keeping track of most of what you're doing, pretty much in order. So if you go to the last cell detection that you ran, all the way at the bottom, um, and double click on it, it brings up this window again, pre-populated with your last settings. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about the the uh, pixel size. Yes. Like this image oh. shows it has three pyramids, one, three, nine. Yes. Uh, if let's, this is like a small example, but if you're actually doing like a big image, does it make sense to have that requested pixel size be the original value multiplied by three or nine, or just any value like computationally? Is it like kind of rescale or something that come more properly? Um, so any value should be okay. And actually, you're slightly better if it isn't an exact pyramid level because they're recompressed and you get new compression artifacts. And if you're um, so you're better if it isn't. But if I just select a little region here, you can see it. For example, if I send the region to image J. And I say that I want to give it a pixel size of, let's say, 0.5. Then it'll make more sense if you're familiar with image J. But basically, you get your image in there, and you can check the properties. And the pixel size is 0 0.5. So QPath can resize to any arbitrary pixel size. Um, but sending to image J allows you to visualize exactly what resolution you're going to get um, whenever the processing happens. But it all happens internally. And it will select the pyramid levels, and you don't need to worry about um, getting the exact okay. exact matches. And I just need to make sure that I've closed image J because it messes with the menu slightly. Okay. 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 So it brings up this window. It's pre-populated. You hit run. Um, since nothing is selected, it asks me, do I want to process my annotations? Yes, I do. So anywhere that you haven't, that, wherever you did not have your original rectangle, it's now a good idea to just go check new regions and just make sure everything looks like you expected. There's no weird surprises. Um, like, okay, it missed some cells. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, you will not be 100% accurate. That's not even on the table. It's not happening. The more cells you look at, the more errors you will find. You're looking for sufficient accuracy to answer your questions. I'm going to close this. Um, from here, we can click on any cell and go to the annotations tab. Where are my measurements? What did I click? Okay, somehow I unclicked make measurements. Not sure how I did that. I pretty much always want that checked. We run it. Sake, run it again. Yeah. Okay. Um, click any cell, and we immediately get a whole bunch of measurements about that cell. Uh, some of the interesting ones are nuclear area, so you could see if your DAB positive cells are smaller or bigger than the others. Uh, circularity is an interesting measure. Um, things like lymphocytes tend to be very circular, things like uh, endothelial cells tend to be very elongated. Um, and the other one that's a big deal is this uh, nucleus optical, uh, nucleus dab mean. And this is, this is how positive your cell is. Um, the negative cell here is 0.06. Um, a positive cell is about six. Okay, how are we doing? Everyone got to here? Raise a hand. Yep, yep, cool. Um, so now we want to actually, we have these, these DAB cells, we want to actually find them. To do that, we're going to use a function called positive cell detection. You pass. Analyze cell detection, positive cell detection. It's directly under regular cell. 
protection. And okay, this is the window, the cell detection window we've been using. This is the positive cell detection window. And you can see the first bunch of it is exactly the same. So you're going to just copy all of your parameters over exactly as I say. So the first step of positive cell detection is identical cell detection. Then we have to set um, some thresholds. Uh, so it asks for three thresholds for dim, medium, and high cells. Um, look around your image to find a cell that is a little bit DAB positive. Um, so maybe not, not something like this, which didn't get detected anyway, um, but uh, KI67 is a nuclear marker. So whatever brown is here can't possibly be real settings, real staining. Um, but I, I saw some down here. Definitely seen some. And it didn't get detected. Sure, this one. So, um, so I'm going to click on here. Look at it in the annotations tab and find the DAB mean of this cell. And it is 0.37. Um, therefore, I'm going to set my lowest threshold to be just a little bit under that. Let's try 0.3. Um, then personally, I like to skip to the to a really dark cell um, like this. And I'm going to change my gamma to 0.45. Let's make it a little. So then here's a dark cell, and it's got a DAB mean of, what's this now? 1.12. Um, so I'm going to set my um, biggest threshold here to 1.1. And then I usually just go with a medium threshold of half rate in between. So what would that be 0 0.7? Um, so if you if you visually have like distinct dim medium uh, dark, you can you can do the same thing to find mediums. Um, and then importantly, uncheck single threshold. Like your annotation and done. I'm gonna do another time. When is this is the last mm -hmm. thing. Okay. So now we zoom. Um, and uh, from here, I recommend you fill in your detections so that you can see all the colors. Okay. Blue are negative cells. Uh, yellow are are one plus, so dim cells. Then you are your mediums, and reds are your uh, my you can see overall percentage of cells that are positive, as well as the H score value that incorporates the number of cells in their intensity. And that is based on your definitions of plus one, plus two, and plus three thresholds. More on that on day three when we will be talking about validation. Now we're going to switch to fluorescence image. We're going to be using immune liver OMA TIFF file. We'll start with Kenneth Kim describing um, what we can see in this image. You know, as, as a pathologist, um, can I ask how many pathologists are here? Okay. Do you ever have the problem that um, folks in research don't necessarily believe that you can see a neutrophil <laughs> or, or a lymphocyte or a macrophage, right? Okay, so um, I, I tried to sort of... Uh, imbue a little robustness into, into what I was doing. So uh, what we came up with is sort of a acute um, inflammation multiplex panel. So what we have here is uh, three channels. And if I'm remembering, oh, if I'm remembering them correctly, um, green is IBL-1. Right. So most people know of IBL-1 as a, um, a marker for microglia, because that's what it's most commonly used for. 
it's too big. However, uh, I, I have some contacts with, with a Japanese uh, school of pathologists. And in Japan, uh, IBO-1 is a uh, well-established marker for uh, macrophages and um, dendritic cells, sort of a pan uh, histiocytic line. So uh, this is where you would see your Kupfer cells in your liver. Um, let's see, the uh, Ly6G is in red. So Ly6G is a marker for um, neutrophils and do you mind if I play with the settings a little bit, Sarah? Yeah, okay. You may want to change the camera to one. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see here. If I can, that's a little saturated, but uh, pathologists in the room, other folks just kind of believe us. This this is this this is not the. Uh, this is not the original image, right? It's no, been a little. It's, it's been compressed to make it fit under. Okay. So see how, <laughs> thank you. See how this is a big round nucleus. This is a big round nucleus. This is a big round nucleus. And this one is, um, this one's not. And if we have a little more uh, resolution, you might be able to tell that this uh, nucleus has some segmentation, meaning it's not just round. It's that kind of like band nucleus uh, that, uh, that Z was uh, showing you earlier. Uh, in the other sample. And then um, CD, uh, CD3 uh, pan uh, uh, lymphocyte marker is in magenta, but I believe we're getting some autofluorescence, like for example, this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I might have set the minimum too high. Oh, it's okay. We're getting some autofluorescence from, from uh, erythrocytes. But um, in summary, that's kind of what, what we have here. I did do um, Z's uh, pseudo H&E magic trick on this one earlier. And um, there's not much in the way of lesion in, in this in this liver. However, you'll see on the uh, the PSR liver, um, there's some interesting stuff there. So, anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. The other thing I want to point out is the whole right side of the tissue is way brighter in every channel across the board than everything and the left. Uh, that's obviously an artifact. It's not that those cells are actually brighter, um, likely due to improper fixation. And Z will give you a whole. Z will talk about fixation for as long as you allow him to. <laughs> he will never stop. <laughs> um, but when you say improper fixation, do you have more specifics on that? Like what would cause that specific artifact? This is a med artifact, which, you know, if you have. You <laughs> um, I think it's a very common thing to see. It, it, it is. It is absolutely very common. He's taking uh, over the podium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, it's more often when you have a big chunk of tissue and the fixity is penetrating very slowly. Right. So, do you have a tips on what? Because like if you're fixing a whole brain, we, I. I cannot tell you about the brains, but I can tell you something about the livers later on. All right, thank you. I just want to make a quick note. We had to scrap a $30,000 uh, experiment because the wrong fixative was used for imaging mass cytometry. People were under the impression that, oh, if any sample can be fixed, it can be imaged using imaging mass cytometry as long as you use care free antibodies. They used blue route high fixation. Oh. Uh, like, I could only get the DNA counter stain, but everything else was basically non existent. And all of those samples have to be scrapped. Okay. Um, yes. We're going to um, do more salt detection. We're going to work on the left side of the tissue where things are a little bit cleaner. Um, and this process is going to feel exactly like we did before. It's just less awesome. um, Analyze, cell detection, cell detection. Uh, it is important that you select the nuclear channel. It, uh, this H3258 is switched. Um, and uh, if you can see that screen, I, I cheated and, and put the put what I would put as the settings there. Um, but I'll, I'll just give you five minutes to find some good settings that you're happy with. <laughs>
Oh, no, that's supposed to say there. <laughs> I tried to cut it off. No. Just like that. Yeah. Um, okay, one thing I, I will point out because it's not quite intuitive, um, Z was talking about this a little bit, uh, the uh, fit depth of the image is very important to pay attention to. Um, when you have fluorescent images, it um, starts with a default threshold of 100. Um, in this case, um, this image is 16-bit, which means it goes from 0 to 65,000, and um, the negative, um, which you can see in the lower left corner, um, you, you can see the numbers. Um, so the like uh, creation to negative areas are, are uh, already in the 400s just because of the offset of the camera. Um, so your threshold definitely needs to be higher than 100. Um, otherwise you get things like this where there, there's no there's no nuclei there. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So Mike, Mike's point is valid. Um, there's four numbers here, um, which are channel one, two, three, four. If you find that confusing, take off the other channels, and now there's one. It it displays whatever's shown. Yes. Did you do the color deconvolution? No. For fluorescence, there is no color deconvolution. Okay. So we're we're good. You have settings. Things are good. Okay. Um, then once again, I'm going to delete this small. Uh, Small rectangles. Yes, I do not want to keep descendant objects. Um, and we're going to practice more annotations. Uh, so I'm going to remember that this is a Mac and the buttons are different. I'm going to just use this. I'm going to create another uh, full image annotation. I'm going to make sure it's unlocked. And then I'm going to use the wand to delete all of the blank space. Um, so hold uh, Alt on a PC. I believe it's Option on a Mac. Um, turn on the wand tool. And just kind of. It's very important to hold down Alt before you start drawing. Yes. If you mistime that, try to do it quickly, you'll we'll just start drawing. And there we have um, a not quite square. It's a letter. Uh, there are more sophisticated ways of getting to this, which we'll get into tomorrow. Um, and once you've got this, run your self detection again. Um, so now for everyone who's there, um, at this stage, I recommend you go to cells, uh, right click cells, cell boundaries only. Um, and that will It'll remove the nuclear outline. It's obviously still there. You haven't actually deleted your, your nuclei. Um, it just stops showing it. Um, and then, then instead of some like half transparency thing so you can see both, it's just fully opaque. Um, also make sure your uh, detections are visible and filled in. Then we're gonna go to measure, show measurement max. Let's see if I and then click on anything. Um, here are your nuclear areas. Uh, purple represents the smallest, which is nine, uh, to 158, which is like this one. Uh, yeah, that's actually, that's just a very big cell. Cool, livers are weird. Um, um, a lot of your uh, endothelium. Uh, are very small. Measure. Oh, go measurement. Yeah, that's right. Um, they're just 
not the <laughs> um, And then we could just go through here and look at the different measurements that exist on every side. Um, so, each yeah. cell is included in the location. Actually, it's not measurement. Normal cells are increasing. Oh, cells, cell, uh, no, nuclear circularity. Is going to be this. This is your mouse. Yes, this is what we always back. It's, it's like weird. I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, you can from here adjust. You're actually adjusting the lookup table of your measurement map um, to change the dynamic range of your measurement map. Because I noticed when I was doing the map for the sound side, I think that's not the case. But you can change the sound. Yeah, the rest of the movie. But the rest of the movie is the whole drive of the drive. But that, like, is that going to affect how it scrolls on the? No, I understand. Yeah, but it's just not going to happen. So if we look at the nucleus circularity, there's this, like, blue, there's this purple area. And those are the endothelium of the big vessel there, and they they immediately light up as not circular, or at least not as circular as I perhaps say. Uh, yeah, that's where she is. Um, we're gonna go to. Uh, you can change. You, if you don't like purple to yellow, you can start messing with this here. How do you? I know. You want to like not actually show any data? Here's jet. <laughs> No, can read this. Um, here is um, cell uh, green mean. So first of all, you can clearly see the gradient of the field uh, fixation artifacts. But if you zoom in and adjust your table, you can start finding. Uh, you can find your IDA one. Um, uh, this is a great thing to export using all the things he showed you before. I makes fantastic figures in a paper. It makes fantastic lab meeting presentations. <laughs> PI love this. <laughs> When you're looking at the measurement yeah. it's like when you yeah. it and then it uh, can show you a script that will allow you to zoom in into a certain area of the slide. That's clear for your Um So that's all the uh, when you first detect cells, it automatically um, calculates mean, min, max, and deviation in all of your channels. Um, in the nuclear compartment and the cytoplasmic compartment. Oh, let me discuss what that means. Um, any measurement that says nuclear is using these pixels. Any measurement that says cytoplasm is using only these pixels. And cell is all of the above. Okay. Yes. What if you don't have a nuclear stain? Uh, what, what stains do you have? Like. Do you have CD45? Cell phones. Cell phones, yeah. Cell phones. Okay. Third day. Okay. Um, in addition to the default measurements, we can add some extra ones. So what I'm gonna so what you should do is go to objects, select, select all cells. And everything will start yellow. And then go to analyze, calculate features. Add intensity features. So I'm going to um, ask for the uh, for the three marker channels. Not so much for uh, um, I'm going to compute parallel features. Okay, these are a little hard to describe because they're they're not intuitive at all. But fundamentally, they're measures of capture. Um, some cell you can have two cells with the same uh, average intensity, but one is uh, granule like and one is just smooth. And those are different cell types, even if they have the same average. Um, and parallel features are a bunch of different ways of trying to measure that. It's not just standard deviation; it's how the pixels relate to neighboring pixels. Um, 
uh, and there's no there's no like really clear way of going from oh your hair like feature is four therefore oh, uh, therefore nothing it doesn't matter like it doesn't mean anything you're just looking at this so compute hair like features min zero yes. max sixty five five three five because this is a nice sixteen bit image um yeah. and then the pixel size should be okay uh usually you want your pixel size to match your actual pixel size for speed's sake, I'm going to make it two pixels. It's not going to affect pixels too much. Um, and I want to process all selected objects. If you did not pre-select your objects, you could say process all cells. You get the same results. I never yeah. match the pixel size to the. I, 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 I always do. No, the, the point one is not too small, but I, if I, it matches to many cells. Yeah, you can go for more details. I guess it's a size size. Right. I don't think you need to worry about the amount of channels, but should I write a more? Um, yeah. Actually, it's indeed, yeah. I never, I, I always post. Yeah. I thought it would be computationally better, so I always. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, once you've got the error like features, and uh, so that the um, there's a progress bar, but nothing like magic happens, it just ends. Then select the annotation. So we've deselected the cells, selected the annotation. Go to analyze, calculate features, add smooth features. Um, Fiona, I, I don't know what's up with this window, but something looks right. <laughs> it's a feature. Um, uh, uh, 25 microns defined. Again, nothing pops up. It just it thinks and then stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. Then go back to your measurement maps. Scroll down, and now you have new uh, measurements. Um. So let's zoom out, and these are your. Uh, these are your measures of texture. Uh, and we'll just to see if anything interesting pops up. Um, oh, this one, this one has whatever F11 is, it's got a lot going on. Um, you have that for every channel. Um, and if we keep scrolling all the way down, to, you've got 12 hieroglyph features for every channel you've selected. At the bottom of that, um, uh, the, you have smoothed every measurement you already have. And this is like, this is a, a um, well, an, a smooth average um, of these things. And it can help get rid of like speckle noise if you have one weird cell that's giant for whatever reason and it throws off all of your lookup tables. Um, and it, you can more see like general, ge general patterns. Um, so again, your your endothelium are, are not circular uh, because they're eccentric. Your top left cells have more moisture for some reason. Um, uh, especially if you if you want to export like the full tissue um, image. Uh, but with these measurements, having the smoothed one, it's, it's just a little easier to read. Um, and, uh, how? Oh, oh, that's what you meant. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. But especially for just Yes. Um, so by default, purple means low and yellow means bright. But if you want the opposite of that, um, again, like here, 
Here. Um, you can drag the max all the way to the left, drag the min up. And now your purple means high. Yes, purple means high and yellow means low, but low is more accented because it's yellow. Okay, last step, sell the export. Um, we're going to draw a couple of annotations around something interesting. There's not a ton that's like super interesting in this file, so we're just going to pretend. Um, so here's something, here's something. Uh, we're going to give these names. Uh, we're going to give them classes. So two are girl model and two are tumor. There's no tumors on the slide. I just need some classes. Um, and we're going to give them names. So this is S1. And this is one. Yeah, just a couple of measurements, a couple of regions anywhere. Um, any names, it really doesn't matter. Um, then I, I want to show you the hierarchy file. We first made the tissue outline, and then within that made cells. Therefore, the cells are children of the tissue outline. We then, after the fact, added these squares. They do not automatically get added into the hierarchy. Um, so if you want them as part of the hierarchy, you have to go to objects, annotations, resolve hierarchy. It'll say this, this actually isn't gonna be too long. Um, and now, when you expand this, you see everything is a child of the tissue annotation. There's four additional annotations. All of these cells are outside those four squares. And within each square, there's a bunch more cells. Okay. Once you've resolved hierarchy, save the file. Um, and it actually, it actually is important that you save here. We good? In terms of drawing these things, yeah. Measure export measurements. Okay. There's a couple of different types of exports we can do. The first one is going to just be the annotations. So we're going to do export type annotations. Um, the default is a tab separated, which I guess is common in Edinburgh. Uh, not comma here. Everyone here wants comma separated, so I, I always just move to CSV. I think our problem was a comma separated whenever I was in Germany. That was what we used with uh, the separators, but it was a okay. massive mess. So yes. tab separated is one that's working very frequently used to that, lots of problems in Europe. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, so here's whichever one you're comfortable with. Okay. Then go to, we're go, we want to export the immune liver file. So I'm going to select it and hit the little white button saying, we're going to export this. Um, and I give it a name by hitting choose and going annotations. That one should be very fast. Um, to open that up, I'm going to go into my project directory. And now I have better. Yep. Thank you. Um, so density would just be number of detections divided by whatever that area. Um, you probably want to multiply by a million um, to, because the area is in microns. Um, and so this will give you the number of detections per millimeter squared. You hit the perimeter instead of the area. Yes, I did. Okay. 
Um, uh, uh, one thing that people are always, I, I actually get a lot of comments that a lot of image analysis is done in Excel. Like you don't have to do everything directly within QPath and just get expect to get an answer. Just get comfortable with with Excel. So that's the annotations export. The other option is the detections export. Um, so it's going to start the same measure, export measurements, pick a file, pick a separator. Um, and now I'm going to, instead of choosing annotations here, choose detections. Um, this will, uh, as, as set up here, um, export every measurement of every cell, which is a lot, and it's just a lot to handle. So I recommend you hit this populate button. And it's going to take a second to think. And then here is the list of measurements you could export. Um, and I don't want to export everything. I just want to export the ones that looked interesting based on the measurement maps you we were looking at before. Um, this would be better if there was actual features in this uh, that were like super interesting to look at. But so I'm just gonna pick a handful, currently at random, yeah, that one. Um, choose, and we're gonna call this predictions. Okay. The detections is gonna be slower because instead of exporting four lines, it's gonna export like 20,000. Up to here. Um, this we're going to open with Excel. Um, so now we have the measurements you selected. Nope, I messed up. Cool. Measure, export measurements. All the same things. I missed an important. Missed a super important. Yep, one of them has to be parent. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Make sure you select. Parent. I'm gonna just keep opening this folder because I, I don't know where it goes. Okay. Um then we go to data, sure. Filter. We have five options in the parent. Um anything where the parent is path annotation object, um, that means it's not in one of those four rectangles we drew. So we could just delete that entirely. Um what we can do here is just select one. Um, and here's the couple hundred uh, couple hundred detections that were inside this square. Um, and from here, you could put it into your favorite graphing program, IVFN Prism. Uh, Google Sheets can also do it. Um, I Excel itself actually can't, but you, but you can uh, just copy paste this and generate a histogram. So you get the, like, the distribution of whatever measurement you care about in every one of your annotations. Um, and you can make very nice graphs that actually show the difference um, between features of interest. Um, and you just copy paste um, for each measurement, um, or you can calculate averages and, and put it into like tests. Yes. Questions? So this was a full day, right? You in initially got dropped into a deep water. You somehow managed to get to the shore. I don't think we've lost too many of you. To the survivors, 